hang on a minute. This isn't a Tuesday or a Wednesday night. What on earth are these lunatics doing going live for a pre post match review? Not a pre match review. We've got pre match preview coming up in about an hour. So if you are of Sheffield Wednesday persuasion, A, what are you doing watching an Argyle versus Ipswich review episode? But B, we will be touching on Sheffield Wednesday a little bit later. Good evening. Um, as you can tell, again, I'm Joe. Aaron's in the gallery this evening. Aaron is on producing duty um, and you're stuck with me for another episode of the Green and White podcast brought to you by Argyle Life. Well, we had our way last year, didn't we? We didn't have our way this year. After a Titanic title tussle at home park, all systems were go to welcome back the old foe in Ipswich Town, this time in Skybet Championship action. Following a fantastic victory at the Riverside last week against Middlesbrough, everyone was highly optimistic as Kira McKenna's tractors rolled into the West Country. However, after a bright first half, some wounds of recent games were sadly reopened, notably by Connor Chaplin's strike after the hour mark, which took a slight deflection, more on that later, off the, um, what do we say, not stricken Brendan Galloway, but he was the unfortunate party in it all, and it flew into the opposite corner to where Connor Hazard had thrown himself in hope of getting away the shot. As the second half then progressed with Ipswich in front, they grew in confidence and Argyle seemed to wane in their own confidence. And lo and behold, Kiefer Moore, you should not allow a player of that quality that chance as he gets on the end of a flick on from Connor Chaplin. I'm sure we'll talk about the uh, the build up to that second goal and what happened, which transpired to Kiefer Moore slamming home yet another goal for Ipswich Town on the road this year. They really are potent in front of goal and sent the 1,700 Ipswich fans home happy, which is something they've not been able to do on many visits to Home Park when fans have been allowed into the stadium. It had been 2008 when crowds were actually in attendance since Ipswich last one at Home Park. Of course, they did get a win during COVID, but as we all know, COVID football doesn't exist, and we've wiped it all from our memories. Joining me this evening, we have fresh after an appearance last week, making back-to-back -back starts on the podcast. Adam, good evening. Are you well? Good evening. Yeah, very well. Although very disappointed that my run of only attending after we'd won has finished before it really started. So I'll just have to make do. Yeah, don't don't tell Adam, but his performance has already disappointed the selectors and he's likely to be out of action on midweek after Sheffield Wednesday. Oh, but you never like. know if he, if he impresses tonight, we might rotate the squad after our trip to Ewood Park at the weekend. Ben, I notice you're wearing a rather um, historic Argo kit from all those years ago, and that was probably the kit we wore last time Ipswich won at Home Park all those moons ago. Quite possibly, quite possibly. It was um, David Norris-inspired choice of kit, so uh, I thought I thought it had to be done given his appearance at uh, the Theatre of Greens this this weekend. Great to see Chuck back at Home Park. If you were one of the thousand people who got a pasty, I hope it was well worth it. Um, do let us know in the comments if you did get a David Norris-inspired delight. And last but not least, he is on his feet once again. Mr Down, how are you? I'm very good, Joe. The last time we lost against Ipswich with fans in attendance, uh, full fans, that is, because actually the Ipswich game was one of the very rare few in the Interregnum where fans were allowed in in the COVID season. Last time we watched with unrestricted capacity uh, us lose to Ipswich was October 2009, October 2008, in fact. So not the kit Ben was wearing a little bit later, but, but a good effort nonetheless. Um, from you um yeah i'm doing okay still a little bit quietly seething about football and yeah sport in general but you know okay that's already a mark against sam's name in undermining the host but here we go unfortunately i have my running order in front of me and i do have to go to sam straight away as well um so you can redeem yourself now sam with a excellent review but a not so excellent result on the 2-0 defeat at home to Ipswich Town. Yeah, not not so excellent result. 
not so excellent performance either, I'm afraid to say. Um, I think the first half we were we were decent. I wouldn't say we were great. Um, I think we you have to respect that, you know, in the first half we at least had a bit of a go at them. You know, give some credit where it's due. We at least put men forward, um, got some decent passing moves together. The execution in the final third let us down. Um we for all our decent play in that first half, we only actually created one good chance. Uh, which was when Whitaker beautifully played um, a ball to Mikel Miller, who sort of caught it on the half volley and, and just, um, he struck it okay, but the defender on the line um, blocked it, uh, didn't he? Um, yeah, um, again, that was a, a good chance. It wasn't an absolute sitter. It was always tough coming to him like that on the volley. Whitaker did very well, but it was always tough sort of coming to him the way it did. Um, it, w- w- without wanting to get those dreaded two letters out that Ben loves and Joe doesn't love, I imagine the the value of that chance would not have been mega high. But you know, it was it was the <laughs> it was probably the best chance of the game up to that point, I would say. Um, and then second half, first five minutes of the second half, we got the ball down the Levin- Devonport end quite a lot. Um, began put a bit of pressure on them that first five minutes of the second half. Unfortunately, they then really started knocking on the door and it was one of those where you could feel the goal was coming and, and sure enough, it did. Not because they outcreated us, it was just an incredibly unlucky deflection. Sometimes luck just really does go against you with football and with that first goal, it did. You can't legislate for it pinging off like that. That, that shot's going comfortably into the arms of Hazard until it takes that ping, I, I'm confident in saying. Um, what I absolutely cannot excuse is how we just collapsed like a pack of cards after that goal went in. Just completely all the stuff we were doing well. Look, I'm not going to sit here and say the first half was an amazing performance. We did only create one clear-cut chance. I mean, even at half, and even then, like I did, it wasn't that clear-cut. Even at half-time, I was saying, you know, for all our decent build-up play, I, I still want to see us have a go at them a bit more. But I was at least, well, you know, taking that mixed view on it. Whilst I was fairly happy, I thought we could have been doing some stuff better. After going 1-0 down, it was just, a, again, a pretty shambolic last half hour, in truth. I'm not going to fully go on, go off on a rant like I did after the West Brom game, because I want to. I will save that level of anger for games where it's really warranted. And as poor as yesterday was, it wasn't quite of that level. Um, so I'm not going to go on as much of a rant as I did. But I really uh, was not happy with so much of what we saw that last half hour. We, I don't think we really got the ball forward much at all until then. Then we went 2-0 down, we did. And we then hit the post, but then that was just a bit of a bit of a, a good break. It was no no build up behind it. There was no targeted, you know, pressing like there was in the first half. Um, Ipswich are a good side, yes, but you know we, we we keep hearing this in every interview, don't we? They're a good side. They're a good side. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just laughing away at the comments there. Um, yeah, we we keep hearing this. West Brom are a good side. Leeds are a good side. Ipswich are a good side. Yes, they are. But we're so much better when we actually go toe to toe with these sides. When we get cowed, which we very rarely do, and um, we very rarely did under Schumacher but seemingly are doing quite a lot under Foster. We, 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 just, we just sit back and we just invite them on us. And we all knew that second goal was coming. I think that there wasn't anyone in the ground who was surprised. Even though they went one the up, we were badly in need of points at home, or at least a point at home with the other teams winning around us. Yet at 1-0, you thought the only goal was coming from Ipswich, not from us. And there was no attempt to regain control of the game. We were just chasing, chasing shadows around the pitch. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty rubbish last half hour. And it was a disappointing lack of intensity, given how badly we needed points on the board. Um, and yeah, what can you say? Three home defeats in a row, three home defeats in a row without scoring, no less. I think um, even even with my encyclopedic knowledge of Argyle, I can't actually remember when we last had three home defeats in a row without scoring. Yes, of course, it's partially a product of the opposition, but not entirely. Uh, once again, I felt we were poor. And for all the brilliant play we saw at Middlesbrough, it was a bit of a back to square one moment for me. Um, I should have mentioned on the intro to tonight's show, um, do stick around because we do have a special guest joining us later on in the show. Um, we're, you know, we're really excited about that special guest joining us. Um, we're going to come to you in a second, Ben. I'm going to go jump straight into full time thoughts. Um, we'll do it. 
platform by platform. So we're going to take a trip to Pasotti Corner um, early on in tonight's episode. Um, and we're going to start off with Biggs, who said, I don't think we were bad at all today, but a niggling concern is that we seem to have abandoned playing out from the back with any sort of high risk attacking plan which may be met with relief by some, but that's how modern attacking football teams play. And that's how lots of our attacks pre-January started. Linked to the form of Morgan, because he's now not getting the ball anywhere near as often. Um, Mutley Marvel says, reluctant referee with the cards, Ipswich schooled extremely well and disrupting our game and knowing the referee would allow them to get away with blue murder. Frustrating to say the least, but we did not have any answers to get anything out of the game. Fozzie will probably say this result will not define our season. Actually, if you're playing Fozzie press conference roulette, you would not have marked that one off your chart. Um, second half, we might as well stay in the dressing room as Ipswich toyed with us, chastening for the players and the fans. Ipswich on another level. We just need to dust ourselves down and focus on our next game. We are not a bad team. Jobo and the senior players will raise the group. Green1886 says, the worrying thing for me is the lack of fight, desire and will to win. Ipswich surrounding the referee from the first minute. Gamesmanship, call it what you want, but it won them the game. Um, I think actually hitting the back of the net twice probably won them the game. I don't think there was too much of that. We were just as guilty from what I was seeing. Um, teams around us pulling out results we can only dream of. Do I fancy us to get anything at Sheffield or Blackburn? Um, you can probably guess what you said to that. Um, then we have up the line, nice of Foster to come out and applaud the remaining supporters like he did after we won, dot, 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 oh, wait. Um, and Fergie, we'll finish on Fergie's points on Sotty Corner today. We did okay today and we were simply outclassed. It was a result that was expected. We really do miss a player to drive us forward from midfield, however. Whitaker's form since Foster came in is also a concern. He has now become the least influential of the front three. Um, ben. It was a frustrating afternoon. Chastening is probably the right word that was mentioned above. However, you have a point you would like to make on not just this game, but also a few recent games. Yeah, I've, I've said both on here and um, on um, on Twitter that I'm going to wait until after the Blackburn game to make any like hard and fast judgments because there's been a you know an awful lot of transition, busy period of fixtures and stuff. But I think Biggs... I think it was big. It's the first comment you read out from Pasotti. So we'll hit the nail on the head there. We are playing a much less high risk style of football. It's much more conservative, not in terms of trying to score, but in terms of the amount of risk we're willing to put into an attack. We'd rather keep possession of the ball because if we've got the ball, the opponents can't score. Problem with that is, as I think we're being exposed, when a team is happy, I mean, West Brom did it excellently happy to sort of sit further back, let us build up and not allow us the overloads. And then, spring a press when when they you know when the trigger is right for them we have no alternative and i think when foster's tactics have worked correctly or worked well in terms of the matchup against the opposition like middlesbrough like cardiff where it plays into our hands it's exciting football but when it doesn't work there doesn't appear to be a plan b and the problem with that is there's a very obvious plan b ready and made in the squad, which is to revert somewhat at least towards the style that was being played at the beginning of the season and that even Neil Jusnip was was playing in the interregnum. Now, I have a feeling that you know Foster was when he came in was very strong on wanting to right the wrongs of the season so far. I think he really wanted to stamp his mark on the team um, and on the style of play and on the club. And I've got no problem with that. But you know, I think that's why he was so hyped up about the away win, getting the away win. He seemed really, you know, fired up about that because that had been a monkey on the back of the club. I think he was trying to sort of introduce a new new world order, as it were, a new regime. Not so much out of ego, just in terms of moving on, setting out a new stall uh, and putting, putting behind us what had happened uh, with, with Schumacher. But I think that might have gone a little bit too far in terms of he's not willing to go back towards that style. And I think it might be a case of if, if he went back towards that style and it had an effect, let's say we go one down, we go two down. He says, right, we'll let everybody off the leash and go and play that more flamboyant kamikaze football. And we, and we get a couple of goals and we get a draw. Both the players in the dressing room, but especially the fans will say, 
well, look, that's what we're good at. Let's do that. Um, now, if we had if you had an alternative plan B for when we go one down, two down, and the and plan A is not working, that's fine. But as no other one seems to be presenting itself, surely reverting to what got us goals and got us results, as dangerous as it might be, in the short term, in the immediate need of we need points on the board, as horrible as it is and it must, might go against its principles, is a good option to take. Once we've got sort of 50, 52 points on the board, then he can be as intransigent as he wants. And I think the key point that Biggs made there is the fact that Whitaker's not getting the ball. I did some maths on the last nine games of um, Schumacher's regime, which of course ended with Rotherham. So you had the Rotherham QPR before that, when we we're down to 10 men, all the way back to through Leicester, Stoke, Coventry, Sunderland, Leeds, Borough, Ipswich and Wednesday. So a good a chunk of those teams we've played in, you know, um, in the games since um, in the last nine games under Foster, for example, uh, um, Coventry, Sunderland, Leeds, Borough, Ipswich. Yeah, so relatively similar run of games. Whitaker got an average of 47.2 touches in those games and 3.3 shots. And in the nine league games under Foster, he's had an average of 33.7 shots and an average of 2.2 shots. Uh, sorry, 33.7 touches and 2.2 shots. So he's basically performing at like 66%, getting 66% of the shots off and not much more in terms of touches. Now, he's our best player, quite clearly. Um, and if we're not, getting, you know, if he's getting 60, 66 percent of the ball and 66 percent of the shots away, that's clearly going to be affecting the outcome of our games negatively. Um, and as that, I think, is, you know, if we were still getting Whitaker the ball under the under under Foster's tactics and he just wasn't doing anything with it. Same with Hardy. Hardy's statistics are likewise touches and shots are down. Um, if we if, if we were getting the ball to our our main attacking players. And, and that was the problem. They weren't finishing. Now, to be fair, they aren't finishing the way they were early in the season. And the goalkeeper isn't doing as well as he was early in the season. So that does also um, affect results partially. But I don't think that any of the results would really have been changed significantly if we were hitting the same sort of accuracy um, and goalkeeping quality as we were early in the season. Might have saved a goal or two, but I don't think any of the results would have changed. So um, I think that's the, the real damning stat when it comes to Foster not having a plan B. We're just not getting the ball to our dangerous players enough. And even if the plan B completely makes him feel sick, there's a plan B ready made that a lot of this squad have played with with Stephen Schumacher and have played an attacking style of football. Um, yes, it may be ill disciplined as far as Ian Foster thinks, but they they've done it. They can do it with their eyes closed. A lot of them let them do it. If you're one nil down, two nil down, what's the harm? You know. It, you're already you're already you know losing continue because it makes us look like we're going down with a whimper because we keep doing the same thing it looks like we've just got no ideas it's not that we've got no ideas that's what the players are told to do and they do it relatively well it's just they're not necessarily equipped to do it in terms of their abilities or the, the the opposition have worked them out like Ipswich first half decent first half went toe to toe you know pretty even we really pressed Ipswich high up the pitch bothered them Second half, they worked it out, made a tweak. We had no answer, and it makes us look, makes the players rather look look stupid and naive. But they're not being they're not being told they can do something different. I'm assuming, um, and 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 you know, it makes us look like we're going down with a whimper, without having that alternative. And I think for the players, but especially for the fans and the atmosphere, he needs to find a plan B quickly, whatever it is, whether it's reverting to a more attacking, whether it's a, a um, formational change. Whatever it is, it, he needs to find something. Otherwise, the atmosphere, I feel, is going to get... I mean, it was quiet. It was dead on Saturday. I mean, the Ipswich fans were even singing, is it a library? And that hasn't happened as bad as it's been at times this season. It's not been quite that bad. I feel like it might even become toxic, sadly, if we can't um, find an alternative way of playing. Because otherwise, we're limited to getting results against teams where our, that allow us our slow build-up and struggle against a high press. Otherwise those are the only teams we're going to beat uh, and that's quite a select pool of of teams that that we got a pick from to that to, 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 will be susceptible to that so we, we definitely you know he really needs to find something that gets our, our best players our, our most attacking players involved doesn't have to be Schumacher ball but if he's got no other ideas that's the pretty decent alternative to fall back on when his tactics aren't working yeah I, I definitely think that obviously the whole 
um plan a plan b thing is a is a big talking point and i'm sure that um we'll get the lads views on that as the the episode goes on um just go to some facebook um comments and i'll come to you adam um adam kreber said we are where we are it's incredible it's an incredibly tough league we're competing but we're coming up short we've lost our style of play let's not forget we've played some decent teams recently Stuart Carr says we now need four wins from 11 games. No reason we can't do it. We can expect to beat teams like Ipswich. The gap in finances is massive. 52 points or so is enough to stay up for him. Uh, Darren Mann says leaving our tallest centre back on the bench when they have a centre forward in the size of Kiefer Moore was always asking for trouble. Um, so that's Darren's thoughts on on Kiefer Moore obviously uh, getting the winner. What turned out to be the the clinching goal shall I say not the winner um Michael Ross Williams says game of two halves first half we did everything but score second as soon as second half as soon as they scored we didn't seem to bother very close to the bottom three now still have the faith and last but not least from Facebook Andrew McMillan says again the tactics were far too negative for my liking I don't mind losing but only if we are actually trying to attack and win might as well have sold Morgan Whitaker for £15 million in January because we have hardly passed the ball to him since, as Ben's stats would now back up. Adam, yeah. can um, I just jump wasn't... in quickly? Because I'm, I'm going to think I'm going to be making way um, for our special guest shortly. But just before you would go to Adam on that question, I wanted to address the whole money thing. We can't be expecting to beat teams you know, who have these, these sort of wage and, and, and budget advantages. But everybody in this league has that advantage over us. At what point do you draw the line? You know, we've taken points off of Norwich. Borough, you know, we took a point off card if you've got a high um, uh, wage bill. Um, there's a lot of teams we've taken points off, even beaten. No, we took a point off West Brom already this season. Um, there's a lot of teams who have massive wage bills and, and budgets who we've taken points off. Yeah, it's, And it's a very dangerous game if you say we can't beat X team or a team that earns X amount or makes X amount or spends X amount. Well, then... Where does where do you draw that line? It's a very arbitrary line to draw. Is it like the nine and a half million we can beat, but ten million we can't beat? Where, where, that's the difference in the wage bill. It's thin end of the wedge stuff to sort of big, big, to sort of have an inferiority complex. It's not the size of the the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight and the dog, as the old adage goes. And that's something Schumacher, for all his faults, that was one of his great strengths. Was he had the players believe and they could go toe to toe with anybody. They, you know, last year he had a, had them their backs against the wall, everyone against us in the title run in. And again, I think, you know, he had it at the beginning of this year, whether there were flaws to his tactics and style, absolutely. But he had that mentality in the players that they were going to go and bloody the nose of anyone they were playing. And I don't think the attitude that all of a sudden people saying, oh, you know, we can't compete with these teams. Why not? It's 11 men against 11 men. Yes, of course, some teams will you know, have an advantage over us. But to just, you know, psychologically, you're half beaten if you say, well, we can't compete with teams that, you know, Ipswich, Ipswich's budget isn't, you know, through the roof compared to ours. And we've gone out and beaten teams like Borough, who've got massive budgets, probably a much bigger budget than Ipswich. So I, I don't buy any of that better teams, better squads, more more money really makes that much of a difference. Otherwise, why would we play football? Why would we bother? If it was that obvious, we'd just know he w wins the league at the start of the, of, of the year. So I'm not buying that. I think that's a thin end of a wedge if you start allowing that kind of inferiority complex back into the club when we've done very well to shake that off recently. Sorry, I'll let you go back to Adam with that question now and I'll bid everyone good night in case I don't get another chance. Yeah, that's fine, Ben. We'll keep you in um, for the time being. We might be able to get round to you for another thought or two um, before, as I've mentioned, we will be joined by a special guest. Adam, um, finally coming to you then into tonight's episode. Um, it Somebody mentioned there, I can't remember who it was, I've only got it decided to me, and Michael mentioned that um, it was a tale of two halves. And the first half, really, there wasn't a huge amount in the game, was there? There was plenty of half chances at either end. Obviously, Connor Hazard had to make a good save from a Kiefer Moore flick on. Um, but we had our chances. JB firing wide, Hardy firing over, Mikhail Miller had a volley blocked. Um, there wasn't a huge amount in it in the first half. How content were you at nil-nil at half time with how we were playing in that first 45? Yeah, I mean, it. there wasn't a lot of in it, absolutely. Um was it exciting? No, absolutely not. And I think that's kind of half the half the pain of this one is that if you're playing, if you're losing these games in in the way you are, um, 
but you're playing good football, you can almost forgive it. Um, whereas the other way around is is quite difficult. Um, but was it effective at least for the first half? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was fine. I mean, I wasn't um, completely enthused, but I don't think I necessarily needed to be. I thought if we carried on um, the way we did, yeah, you know, I, I imagine the way the plan was carry on as we are doing, and maybe. If we get the ball to one of our better players, we can nick a goal and win the game. I don't necessarily, against Ipswich, who are pushing for a return to the Premier League, think that's a bad way of doing it. And 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 with that in mind, yeah, I wasn't particularly fussed at the nil-nil um, with the, the thought that we could come through. But it is with a significant benefit of hindsight that was that first half good enough when you consider how then we carried on the game? No, I guess it wasn't <laughs> because it, ultimately, if that's what you've, um, if that's what you've got to look forward to, and you're not actually trying, I, I say not actually trying, you're not actually getting yourself on top in that first half when, when perhaps we could have done, um, then yeah, you're, you're you're setting yourself up for a struggle. It's it's a shame because if we're if we were to look at this and perhaps that deflected shot didn't go in, and incidentally. I've agreed with just about everything that's been said on this podcast so far. The only thing I've disagreed with is um, Sam mentioned that he thinks that Hazard would have saved that shot from Chapman. I personally think that shot was heading straight for the barn bark end and would have been absolutely fine. And Hazard would not have needed to get close to it. And alas, that's what happens. Um, so, you know, if that doesn't happen and we, and we don't have that strike of, stroke of luck go against us, then maybe we do come out of the game with, with, with a result from that style of play and, and, and we're happy. So it's it's... It's one of those, isn't it? I was satisfied at halftime. I, I wasn't being kept awake, but I was satisfied. Um, but it, it, it's the way these teams, these games go, and the teams that have that quality and the teams that are at the top tend to find a way. And it's it's something that Argyle are going to need to do ultimately, because there was another comment um, as you went through Facebook, and um, I, again, apologies to whoever it was because I can't remember any of the names that you fired at me, but um, you mentioned that that has been a tough run of games and that should be or, or could be a turning point at this stage. Now, I remember back to mid-January in the build-up to the Cardiff game and there was an impression almost that um, we we kind of need to win this. So if you've seen the fixtures that, that are to come, we kind of need to beat Cardiff to get ourselves that breeze in the place. And as it happens, well, here we are. If we didn't beat Cardiff, we're suddenly um, in the relegation zone at this stage. So it's it's all one of those. And that run of difficult games now should be at an end. And that's not to say that the result's going to change. That's not to say the style's going to change, but it should be easier now. And if we were to continue with the way that we played against Ipswich in the first half, where I've said I'm quite satisfied against the so-called lesser teams, and we still then go ahead and, and, and lose 2-0 to a couple of really disappointing goals to concede, then yeah, I, I'm... I mean, dire straits at that point. But um, as it was yesterday, you know, I think I think you've just got to take it as it comes in in the grand scheme of things. It was not exciting. It was not pleasing. And yeah, that, no, nobody's leaving with a smile on the faces aside from those in the away end. But it's it's one to take on the chin. We're still not in the relegation zone as it stands. We've got those games to come. If we can put our style of play in that's not exciting, but we win, then you know what? I can forgive it for the way we're going forward. But I guess it's a big if. We'll see. Sam, um, Adam mentioned there that, you know, the way Ipswich set up and that it was a scrappy first half. There was no real flow to it. Um, referee Josh Smith was quite involved um, in that first half, even if his hands obviously weren't um, necessarily cold enough to put them in his pocket during that first 45 minutes. Um, and that's on both teams, by the way. That's not me um, having a go at the referee just because he was biased one way. I think um, on the whole, he probably had a pretty disappointing day for both teams. Um, but he says about good teams finding a way Ipswich's second half performance and how they adapted to the game and how they got got imposed themselves, how they got their style across. Is that not just what we did last season to teams? Teams will have felt at half time that they were still in the game and then we would just assert ourselves and our quality last season shone through. And this is just us taking it on the chin. That fair play to Ipswich. They dealt with it. They got control of it. And they thoroughly deserve the win. 
Yeah, um, there are a lot of parallels between um, us last season and Ipswich this season. Um, Aaron tweeted that from from the Argyle Life account earlier. Um, you know, loan loan needs playing a role. A lot of deflected goals playing a role. All the stuff that they wound us up about last year is the stuff that they're having go in their favour this year. And that's not me trying to wind them up with that comment. It's just a, a genuinely quite a funny irony to it. Um, and I think one of the Ipswich fans actually said in reply, yeah, you know, I can see how you how you felt last season, how everyone writing you off was actually, you know what, maybe you need a bit of luck to go your way to compete with teams far bigger budget than you because actually Ipswich's budget relative to Leicester, Leeds, Southampton is probably even smaller than our budget relative to Ipswich Wednesday and Barnsley. And yeah, and, and credit to McKenna, he's doing an absolutely fantastic job this season. I, I, I still don't like the way they conduct themselves on the pitch with all their players absolutely berating the ref at every opportunity, getting in his ear, putting pressure on. Uh, I don't like Morsi the way the way he is. Another horrid foul on Randall in the first ten minutes. He absolutely I think he nearly battered Randall in the previous home game, and he made a good start towards doing it again here. Um, I, don't, I don't like a lot of their players, really. I mean, they're talented, but I don't like them. <laughs> they're, they're, oh, you blame probably, them in disguise. Yeah, they're, they're probably players you'd bloody love if they played for your own team. But, like, you know, I probably would love Chaplin if he played for us. I'd probably love Davis if he played for us. But I think they're a pair of little expletives when, when they're playing for Ipswich. But, yeah, I don't know. It's they, they are a good team, no doubt about that whatsoever. They did impose control on the game. Look, as we've probably all agreed on, that still doesn't you know, excuse the inferiority complex. That doesn't excuse the way we dropped like an absolute stone. Um, but yes, credit to them. They did very well. And if the analogy holds that they are the us of League One last season, then that might mean they win the league. And maybe Leicester will do the role of Sheffield Wednesday, uh, drop into the playoffs and win them. Who knows? But that's maybe that's just me being a bit too speculative. But um, yeah, got to give credit to them where it's due. Fair enough to them. Certainly have. Ben, um, your time has come. The the fourth official has put the board up and it is time for a substitution. Good to see you, mate. I'm sure we'll see you either midweek Thanks, or at the weekend. Have a good evening, all. Cheers, ben. ben is out. And Keith Stroud, who was on fourth official duty, is about to raise the substitution board. And we are delighted to say, making his green and white podcast debut. Hello. Is the one and only... Jack Pieface McDermott. Jack, are you well? I am good. How are we, boys? All right. Well, I say I'm good. I don't know about after yesterday if I'm good, but it was uh, well, yeah, it, painful. Give us your give us your lowdown because you've just tweeted that you might have a minor meltdown. So why don't we get that out of the way and then we can focus on on other things? Yeah, that's fine, as we mate. go on. I mean, yeah, I say minor. I didn't know if it was going to be like full on. I did, only only because like. I kind of want to be a little bit balanced. And I feel the first 45 minutes, we were actually quite good. Like, I thought we matched them. I thought we played all right. Um, but then what annoyed me about that is, I think they were there for the taking. Um, we just, again, like, no no goals at home, three games. Just played the same side to side. And, and, then, and then it's just back to the classic days of, we can see, gone. No clue. Absolutely no clue. Like... At the, end of, like, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm just a fan, right? Like everyone else, like you boys, you know, like I, I have no clue myself. I'm just expressing my opinion. But surely anybody can see that Houghton, I think, is the key to the midfield. And he took him off. I didn't get it. He, like he connects, he connects us going forward. When he come off, I just thought it fell apart. Um, and then, yeah, I just don't understand like the substitutes. And then, you know, like. Bundu coming on the, the second, like we can see the second. I don't know, mate. For me, it's just I think, and I, and I don't mind saying it because I know I've had a, like you know a few people that they don't like me like saying it in the way that I do think the club is the, the people at fault. Really, it's not necessarily Foster's fault that he's been put in a role that, and I hope I'm wrong. That I don't think he's good enough for. I don't think he's a um. I don't think he's a. A championship quality manager. I, I really don't like. I don't think his media handling is very good. And I think that is an important part of trying to connect with the fans and the club, right? Like you want to feel like you're you're part of the club. Even back when we had Derek Adams, at least he give you a bit of grit, like a little bit of something. Even Low give us something in the media. It was after the West Brom game. Just come out and set. I think people would have been a lot more resonating if he came out and said, "You know what? We were rubbish. It was a." 
terrible performance, but we were tired. And I would understand that more if he did come out and say that. But instead, he came out and tried, you know, to play it off. We we were we were awful, absolutely awful. And it was the same yesterday. Like I'm I, like Tuesday is what biggest game of the season, and we have to turn up. We literally have to turn up. But <laughs> again. The club are the people that employed him, and, and I hope I'm wrong. And I, you know, we get six points from six, and I'll be laughing at myself with egg on my face, and we'll all be looking back at it thinking happy days. But yeah, I'm not. I don't know. It's just something about it, really. It's just something about it. I think again as well, we struggle to get creative players in. We we lack that massively. I think we really do. I do. I do think our our, our structure in terms of the players and ability we've got though is actually really good. I think our starting sort of 11 actually is solid. That's how I'd see it, in my opinion, in terms of like our starting 11. Um, but again, it's like there's no ta- – like there's just no tactical – why are we staying with five at the back, you know? We're, like when we went 2 nil down, we looked like we were done. And as Dave says, right, already – how long has Foster been in charge? The, I feel like the fans are already losing faith, and I think that's the problem is once the players – once the once – the, the, the the fans are already not connecting with Foster um, or already like believing already in him. Like- I think that could be a problem. So yeah, sorry for the minor meltdown there, but that's just sort of how I feel. So I don't want to be overly, I don't want to be overly critical. It's not like I just want to like do here and slag and slag and slag. Like it's still early, right? And And I'd rather, I would love to make this clear. I would rather be absolutely wrong. You know, we go on a really good run. We play good football. He keeps us up. Happy days. No problem. Like, that's fine. But I worry that I, that, that isn't necessarily going to be the case. And that, it like, it is going to, you know, potentially go a bit wrong. But I believe in the players. That's the one thing. I, I do believe in the players. I really do. But, like, what's going on with Wicker, for example? Like, that can't just be a, a player thing, surely. You know, it, it, like, the way he's being played, like... And he needs he needs he needs balls and passes, and I think that is the biggest problem with the Foster style is our connection from defense to midfield to attack. It's just I don't think we join it together well enough. I really don't. I really don't. My worry is on Tuesday is he just and I like for sure, but I do prefer Houghton. My worry is he won't play Houghton. I do I do worry I do worry he won't play Houghton on Tuesday, and I think he's the key. I really do, and I know I, I scream that a lot, but for the connection. For playing the ball through, I think he does so much for the team. It's nuts. But yeah, I'm done. Apologies. Sorry for the. Bye. I've seen your meltdowns. That doesn't even touch the sides, mate. That that was a, that was a half a meltdown. Yeah, at most. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to keep it calm, <laughs> calm, Sam. I'm like, I'm trying to. I don't want to go too mental because Tuesday. I'm yeah. I'm kind of waiting for if it goes wrong at Tuesday. That's where it all. You know, that's where it all fully fully be lost. I, I'm I'm not. I wasn't as angry as after West Brom. We weren't as bad as we were against West Brom. To say first half, I do think we were quite good. We did, we did match them, but we just had no intention of like no sucker put. Like I feel so badly for the, the the boys up front. They just don't get the service. But you, this then this is the thing. We know it's the system because we we've seen under Schumacher they can play the football. You know what I'm saying? Like, do you know what I mean? We can we can see it. The um, we can see it. The football that Schumacher plays. That it was they could play an attacking style, so we know they can play it. That's the thing. We know they can do it, and all of a sudden they can't. Don't make sense. In in all fairness, Jack. To be fair, um, Sam has had more spectacular meltdowns than that. Um, one one being about ten days ago, post the West Brom game, um, which I'm surprised still hasn't been clipped up and put around everywhere. Let's get some Twitter views. Um, Full time thoughts that will round off the holy trinity of full time thoughts. Jack Leslie says knew we'd lose as soon as our fan base started singing Championes. Scrappy first half, but let's be honest, we were poor in the second half. Deserved absolutely nothing. Created next to nothing. Ian Foster once again showing his lack of tactical nous as he did nothing despite us being overrun. Pete Robinson says relying on Miller too much for any ground offensive. Barry Evans says lacked creativity and energy going forward. On to the next game. We need something out of Tuesday. Uh, I'm going to butcher this one. Uh, Kerouac99 uh, says as flat a performance as we've had at home. Um, I'm guessing Kerouac was not at the West Brom game. Uh, nothing too nothing too dire in the first half, but the second half we seemed leggy and played into their hands, dropping off exactly the same as the West Brom game. 
I spoke too soon. Um, and then we had a bit of interaction from Ipswich fans. Um, always happy to get interaction from opposition fans. Uh, Luke says, boys, that was by far the easiest run out we've had. Even better with five starters missing. Cheers for the six. Uh, no, you only scored two, Luke, not six. Um, and the other Luke, the other Luke that's an Ipswich Town fan, said, as above, uh, nice to have the set, nice to have the shoe on the other foot this season. Massive potential banana skin navigated from our end. The shoe was on the other foot, Sam, or Adam, even. We've been to Sam again. Uh, Adam, the shoe was on the other foot. Um, deflection FC. Um, it was always going to happen, wasn't it? There was a deflection at Portman Road, there's a deflection at Home Park, and what a massive slice of luck it was. And it, it really did change the game. Yeah, I, I know I've mentioned it before, and it's um. Well, it's one of those, isn't it, where there's a certain irony in us conceding goal to a massive deflection and a lone player to a fan base who has spent the last year telling us that deflections and goals by lone players actually don't count. So I'm sure they'll be getting in touch with the EFL to hand back those points. And that one that we'll get will obviously obviously really help us out. But um, I think, yeah, in all fairness, we, we've kind of covered um, covered off the point of the of the way that they won it and the way that that you know that there was a stroke of luck that went against us. I think that's absolutely clear. But at the same time, did the better team win the game? Yes. Did we deserve anything from the game? No, I wouldn't say so. So it's um yeah, the shoe is very much on the other foot. But I hope this helps some of those um some of those fans in Suffolk to realise just what we were doing last season and realise actually it's not all about good fortune. It's about finding your way over the line. They did that yesterday. We did that for 101 points last season. Yeah, so. they do that a lot. Sorry, I didn't. Apologies <laughs> to interrupt. It's just they, no, they do though. They do that this season, and like that is a in a way like yeah. Luckily, take you so far. That is a credit to Ipswich. Like they they do find they do seem to find a way. Like in so many games. I mean, I, I don't think they look that they were they were good second half. But there's not been many teams that have come to home part of this season where I've gone, actually, they look really... Like, Leeds look really good. Um, Southampton look pretty good at the start of the season. Like, there's no one who's come down, though, where I thought, actually, they look like like quality. Like, Birmingham, ironically, actually, I thought was one of the hardest games we had all season when they came down. So, um, but, yeah, they, they find a way, don't they? And they did, that we did in League One. I, they, they, they were a better team than us in, in League One. In my, like, no question they were a better team than us. But we... We we just you know we kept on picking up points and managed to keep them at bay. But no, it's I think it's going to be it, it's going to be difficult now, isn't it? It's going to be difficult now for us. We just got to try and it's hard to believe though, isn't it? It's so hard. It is why I lose my head again. It's just so hard to believe when we when you don't believe in the manager, and that's the issue. After ten games or eleven games, you don't believe in the manager. The manager there is yeah very much keen. I think as as you touched on the way that he's handling the media, the way that he's um doesn't have the plan B. I think what the impression I'm getting right now, without wanting to, to lose my head entirely, is that Foster clearly has coaching credentials. Does he have managerial credentials at this point? I the jury's very much out. Uh, I think as as has been said, um both both by yourself, Pi and the and what we've had previously, you know, he could come out after that West Brom game and say, that wasn't good enough we were crap and say, okay, well, we've got reason, you know, maybe we can put mitigations in, but own it. If he comes out and says something like, I recognise that wasn't good enough. It's something for us all to learn from, something for me to learn from. For an inexperienced manager, I think we'd all respect that. Yeah, I agree. I just, I just look at, uh, at Foster now and my, I'm almost thinking back to the, to the John Sheridan days, almost of the first goal being, being absolutely crucial. I mean, yes. <laughs> okay. You know how it is. We, yeah, we yeah. won, we won the Cardiff game after going a goal down fine. You know, that, that, that was um, a useful one coming from behind. But since then, realistically, I mean, okay. Yeah. We scored first at, at, at Sunderland, but the first goal crucial against Swansea, um, both teams don't score in, in in many of our games at the moment, which feels a world away, to be honest, from from where we we were, um, honestly, just a couple of months ago, which is is all is very strange. I think is is the way I put it. So my hope, obviously, I, I don't want to lose too much faith just yet because of the point I made earlier about the fixture list. You know, we could easily be finding ourselves in a couple of weeks' time with a couple of wins behind us, thinking, okay, yeah, may, maybe that was premature, but. Right now, it's beginning to look like the first goal is going to be crucial in an awful lot of our games because I'm not getting the managerial now from Foster 
that he can turn it around. And like everybody else who said that, I hope I'm wrong. And I hope we go on and, and realise that he has actually got more strings to his bow than his, his one, you know, the one shape that he likes. Um, because, I, yeah, at the minute, I doubt it. And I think, you know, when it works, we've seen at, at Burrow away. That was one of our best performances, arguably our best performance of the season. It can work. He's clearly got some coaching coaching nows behind him to that, that, that can suit this team on occasion. But when it's not going quite right, I, I yeah, my, my faith is, let's say, dwindling for the purposes of this. And um, yeah, very much hope that he can prove me wrong. Sam, before we before we touch on any individual performances that, that you guys want to pick out, there was a second goal in the game. Um, and this one was a little bit more from an Argyle point of view, baffling the most because it's come from a set piece. And from what I could see, we didn't win a single contact at any <laughs> point during that phase of play. It's come, Burgess wins the header at the back post. Chaplin then wins a, uh, a flick on when he's really not challenged. And Kiefer Moore has got, I mean, he, he probably could have brought it down before he hit it, let alone hit it on the volley. It was just a mess from our point of view, wasn't it? Yeah, well, if you're letting a man of Connor Chaplin slides with a header, something's clearly gone wrong, hasn't it, uh, somewhere? Yeah, um, my sarcasm aside there, nobody picked any of them up. Um, yeah, high ball goes across the box. Half the crowd started giving it the way, thinking it was going out. And then I just said, no, no, it's not going out. And yeah, came back in. Um Gibson and Galloway were just both, and they're both players I like a lot, so I don't, don't want anyone to think I'm digging them out too badly, but despite the fact they've both had good seasons for us, they were both completely statuesque for that goal. Um, and Kiefer Moore, like we said, had all the time in the world. He, well, Aaron's just said what I what I said, Lewis Gibson's been phenomenal all season, but he has to do better, couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, and Kiefer Moore has all the time, you know, he could have brought it down, probably. Obviously, he just goes first time for it and, you can't say he's done wrong because he scored, but he had all the time in the world that he could have brought it down um, because the defending was very inadequate. And, and ultimately, come on, that's 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 meant to be Foster's bread and butter. You know, we could kind of, to a degree, accept abandoning the attacking style if we were actually reliably good at defending and, and didn't make errors like that. But the fact that we've, we've gone to this defensive shape, we've gone to this defensive style, and we're still letting in absolutely criminal goals like that, it's, it's quite concerning, really, um, is the only way I can see it. It was a badly defended goal. But, you know, like I said earlier in, in the pod, I think we'd just given up by then almost. But, you know, given up is a bit harsh. But as, as, you know, as, as I said, I trust the squad. They are professional footballers. I don't think they would have actually and given up as Sam, such. Does this, does this go back to the soft mm -hmm. underbelly we referred to after the West Brom game, that we're a bit of a I soft think, touch yeah. when, when teams get on top of us? I think it does, yeah. Um, I think it does. And and if you look at um, under Foster so far, in terms of we've not done a great deal from from losing positions. Yes, Cardiff was the big exception to that. We did get a win and we played fantastically in that second half. I, I still think that second half owned to Cardiff is, is the best the Foster era has been. But that worries me because that was so early in his tenure. So if that's the best it's been, that worries me. That could just be put down to a bit of a new manager bounce or it could be put down to, you know, the players still subconsciously playing the Schumacher away rather than, you know, without being horrible, rather than him actually earning the credit for that, you know? So, yeah, I think ever since that Cardiff game, there has been a bit of a soft underbelly. I know we did also equalise from a losing position at home to Leeds in the cup, but that was just completely out of nowhere. That free kick was probably the only time we got it in the half or game. So that was just one well-executed set piece, really. So... Yeah, maybe I'm being a bit harsh, and maybe we'll, maybe you know we will start to get a couple of points or even win some losing positions. But the, I worry there is a soft underbelly. We, like, as we've all probably agreed, the first half was it brilliant? Was it edge of your seat? No, but it was all right. Yeah, it was, it was just, all right. It yeah. was it was all right, Sam. I think yeah. I I've seen. I sorry to f interrupt. At least I seen a couple of comments. I I seen Rosa. She made a good comment there. Losing to Zaz was critical. And if we are going to take the other stance here, right, and I don't mind saying, I know they hate me saying this, and I don't even care. I, I literally, I'll, I'm a football fan at the end of the day, so I'll say how I think. It comes down to the club, right? We're a well-efficiently run club, and that is a fact. I totally agree. We're, we're well run in a financial sense that we're, we're well run and we don't overspend, et cetera, right? But are you telling me that in the championship, 
you know, like I, you, I know people are saying oh, a million pound is a lot of money and because of higher figures. But realistically, if we if we could have got us as if we could have got us as for a million pounds, like how key is that? You know what I'm saying? In terms of ambition, showing a bit of something. So you have to almost give that a little bit in Foster's, I guess, side. I know, I know I'm not a Foster fan, but you have to throw that in that really have they has he been able to bring in anybody? We, you know, we've lost a key attacking player. Um, I've been disappointed with Divine. I expected a lot better. I, I can't lie. I, from from what Port Vale fans are saying and from what I'd seen it, doing at the youth at Spurs, I thought he would have been more creative. And again, I don't know if that's because of the position and the role he's played. In Forster, I do think it's been a great sign and he's clearly a quality footballer. And I think Phillips is outstanding. So that does go there. But I just think we need to sometimes, and I'm not saying go and spend millions and millions, but sometimes I think you have to make that investment, right? You know, I feel like sometimes we have to do that. So it's fair play to William. I, I don't know, like, in terms of, like, the situation is that, but we know what he went to, what he went to Borough for. I just think for us, he was, he was, you know, really, um, really key. So I, yeah, it's worrying, isn't it? It is, it is worrying. I, I think it is a balance. Go on, Sam, very quickly. Well, very, very quickly. I think there's a balance in that. Nobody wants us to overspend to the extent we did 14 years ago. Yeah, Absolutely. Great, I totally I don't think yeah. But, but also, we do have, and I know I keep saying it like a stuck record, the latest accounts do show £5 million in cash reserves. And I think the, very much the mindset in the summer was, and I think this is pretty much an open secret, we were going to spend a million on his ass until it became clear that Bali Mumba became available. At the time... At the time, spending a million on Mumba seemed more justifiable than on Vavs because Mumba had a better season last year. Obviously, Vavs had a much better season this year. That's just the way it goes. But I wonder if with, with the cash reserves that were there in the club, could, could we maybe not have found, found a way to get all three of them in, as Vavs, Mumba and Whitaker? Look, I, I don't want to go too extreme on overspending. I certainly wouldn't want us to borrow money to buy players because that's how... That's how we do get in the in the brown stuff financially because when we have to repay our debt. But this wouldn't have taken borrowing players. This would have taken sorry, wouldn't have taken borrowing money. I should say it would have it would have been an, a, a, an investment. Yes, a risky investment, but I think a worthwhile one. Anyway, that that's going off on a bit of a tangent. So I'll let Joe go back to his running order. Yeah, well, I just want to very quickly. We're going to go on to the questions, um, and then we'll go on to talk about Tuesday night's game against Wednesday, which we were originally planning penciled in talking about Wednesday on Thursday, but Sky got involved and have moved Wednesday to Tuesday, so now we'll be live on Wednesday. Um, if you're still with me after that, well done. Um, open forum for the three of you. Um, do you want to pick out any performances from any of the players? Um, because Fozzie says it, you know, you've got to take the positives out of it, you can't just rely on the negatives and I do get that to a degree we're, we're back on the road again on Tuesday night were there any um of the what we made all five changes didn't we of the 16 that featured on on Saturday is there anyone anyone wants to highlight more than any Miller, others Miller unreal I've seen people slander him I don't get it he is under he's quality I think he's a quality player I do I do I do he was I thought he was our best player by far out of the bunch to be honest with you on on Saturday, that's just my that's just my two cents. Um, it's the same, really. On on a, do you know what? And I'll be honest, on a disappointing scale, like I am the biggest Adam Randall advocate, right? I think he should probably. Yeah, he's one of them players I'd like to see. We we keep for fifteen years, captains of the club. You know that that Paul Warren esque type player that we just have forever because I think he's unbelievable. But I think he has been out of form the last few games. I think that's important because he can give us that creative spark. And I've been a little bit disappointed that he hasn't done that in the last few games. I think it was like the West Brom game. I was shocked he got as long as he did without being subbed off. And I think that was the other thing that annoyed me, as you say, in terms of the 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 uh, the substitutes. So, but I think the I think Colin the Miller Mumba on that left hand side could be really good if 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 we've got a way to work it. You know, having one playing further forward and one at wing back. Um, I'd love to see that if we could make it work. I think that would be dangerous. Um, I would I would say, um, in fairness, um, I know that uh, Pye didn't see all of his game because he was on the bus that, that got uh, badly delayed, but I think Randall had a very good first half at Middlesbrough. I know that, um, oh, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, excluding the, exclude, exclude yeah. the Middlesbrough game, Sam, because everyone yeah. was class at Middlesbrough. Sorry, I'd make that clear. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to yeah. everyone was quality at Middlesbrough, so... 
Yeah, that's fair. Even so, I would say that in like the Leeds home game in the league, he was one of our better players that day and got man of the match. So I agree he was poor yesterday, and I agree he was poor against West Brom, as, as they all were. But um, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily agree he's on bad form. Miller, look, uh, I'm trying... I'm genuinely open to hearing other opinions. Am I, am I just missing it with Miller? I get why people like him to an extent, because he, he has that energy of gets his shoulder down, runs with the ball, and looks like he's about to do something dangerous. And, and I get that. The problem I have is that, is that the end product is, is almost never there. I think yeah, he's, he's, a left right. back, um, he's a left back. He's a left back. Well, like, he's a left back that's literally providing attacking intent because do you know what? We've got no one else because we play such a dross style of football. Uh, the amount of times he drove uh, us forward, I'd rather that than play side to side for 90 minutes. At least he showed some fight, you know, like, and, and yeah. there is that level of exciting, excitingness. I do agree that, yeah, maybe the end product is lacking but the amount of crosses he's getting in the amount of times he's getting up that sort of left hand side I, I don't know I think he's class that's just my opinion I, I, can, I, I honestly can see your point of view and I think maybe I have been a bit too harsh on him because having read almost absolutely everybody was raving about his performance and I came away moaning about him maybe I did get it maybe I did maybe I have just got tunnel vision when it comes to him and I just don't see the good he brings but at the end of the day just the amount of just like simple things he did wrong. He was like passing the ball out for a throw in or, or messing up short passes. What's for all the good he did in that sense was quite a lot. And also I still think you've got to say for, for, you know, he, yeah, I take the point he's a left, he's playing as a left wing back. He is ultimately a winger by trade for someone who's been a quite an attacking player for most of his time in the club. He has still only got one goal and two assists in his entire time in the club. And let's say that the goal wasn't really his goal, if we're being honest. But to, to really, if that goal was given as an own goal, that's zero goals and two assists in his entire time at the club. So I just think that, that yes, you know, I get that the end product is always going to be there, but I just think often it seems like the end product's very rarely there. And for all the, yes, he does drive us forward, I just think he's lacking a little in that regard. Um, in terms of a player I want to give a positive shout out to, I would say a player who I moaned at a lot earlier in the season, but I do think he had a very solid game yesterday, Pegafuelo. Um, don't think he let much go down his side. Most of their threat came down, um, came either through the middle or, well, it was Gibson and Galloway could maybe do better for the, for the goal. Um, and obviously Galloway's deflection, unfortunate for the own goal. So I don't think Pegafuelo did, did much wrong at all in the game. Um, for someone who I wasn't impressed by him too much early in the season, um, I do think he, he was very solid. And I think that's, you know, he's keeping Phillips out of the team at the moment. So credit to him. I tend to agree on Peggy. And um, yeah, I'm a, a little bit sad that you've stolen his name from my mouth, but it's fair enough. I think if we, if I just want to look at Miller again, I, I think probably the truth lies somewhere between the two. I think the, the words, you know, Miller was probably the best of the bunch yesterday was was mentioned. And I think he probably was, in truth, looking at um, what he offered and, um, and and some of the stats after the game. I think possibly it says a bit about the bunch, right? Like if, if Mikael Miller is coming out of the game as your best player, then maybe that's an issue. You know, like, you know, he's he's been one of those where um, I think there's actually a lot of inconsistency to his game, which is a little bit annoying in the sense that, yes, he... Yesterday, I, I agree, looked on our main threat um, on another day, um, could have scored, but that's an end product debate that I think I think has been had. Equally, there are games that I go to and think, how how has this guy made it in the championship? Like, why are we lining up with a with a League One winger as, a, as our left wing back? It, it, it's bizarre. And then the next week, he'll 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 make me eat my words again and, and he'll put in one of his, his better performances. So I, I do think the... The truth lies somewhere in between. I think, yeah, he's he stood out certainly yesterday. Um, and I know it's a it's a small field um, considering the performances and and, and Plaggy, as I say, is, is another name I was going to mention. But Miller's very much up there. Um, I just think that says a bit more about everybody else that that he's the one shining, if I'm honest. And and that's nothing uh, against the guy because, as I say, he's for, for, for what he did and what he offered um, most recently, he did very well. It's just that we shouldn't be looking or shouldn't be having to look towards him as our main attacking outlet because the the, the end product hasn't been there. So, you know, he he, he did shine. And I I, I think it'd be unfair not to say that. But it it's a weird thing to say. He he shouldn't have to. 
it is probably the way I'd put it because we ain't got anything else, have we? Like we don't that's like, it. like who? Really I, 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 if no. I didn't, if I yeah. didn't look at the team shadow, I wouldn't know what formation we were even playing yesterday. Because one minute where could look like he was wide, one minute he looked like he was down the middle. I, and the the one thing I was going to add is the one thing we we always seem to have, and that I think we're really lacking now, is, is the fight. You can be bad, but you can still put up a fight. At two 0 that was it. Foster sat down on the bench with his hands in his pockets. The players just seem to lack any, you know, that, that commitment. And is that because they don't want to play for the manager already? I, for me, it comes. It, for me, it all comes down to Foster. We we are and, and we are. A, a a League One club in the championship. I know people like to say that, but we are in the championship. We do have the quality. We we know, we've seen under Schumacher, we've got the quality. The players can do it and they're not doing it. So that comes down to A, the club for the people that they appointed, an inexperienced manager that effectively, and I hope I'm wrong, isn't championship quality. And that's not Foster's fault that he's not good enough. That He got the job. The club gave him the job. He clearly doesn't know how to handle the media. He hasn't got a plan B. He's not playing the football he's promised he's going to play. You know, is he already losing the players? You know, is he? He's, I feel like he, from reading social media, he's losing the fans. So, yeah, so I don't want to lose my head again because I will do because it really annoys me. But, that, you know, that's just... That's, like, regardless, um, isn't on, it? Sorry, just going to say, regardless of, of whether you think he, they're they're playing for the manager, whether they think he's lost it. I mean, ultimately, we don't know. But the optics, I think, are are not great. And it all goes back to, to Foster's inexperience and the fact that he's got to learn on the job. And he's got to learn pretty damn quickly at this point. I mean, things like not not looking like you want to change things at 2-0 down. I mean, I I don't necessarily buy into that everybody needs to show passion at the end of the game. But it's something as simple as um, going to clap the fans at the end of the game. It's not going to make a material difference, but not doing it. It, it's just it gives people a stick a stick to beat them with. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You just handed them. Yeah, you just handed them the keys. Yeah, you. So yeah, it's keys. it's one of those, isn't it? Where he, I, I'm not going to make the point of um, yeah, the 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 coaching and the manager managerial side of it again, but he clearly does have to learn quickly, and perhaps time's running out. Um, yeah, this week. And doesn't that come back though? And doesn't that come back again to the point of that? Yeah, it, obviously it was a gamble, but why are we appointing someone as you're like? You have to think with how long the appointment took. There were better candidates that. At the end of the day, what we needed this season was in the position we were in was to just solidly make sure. I think we, you know, stayed up, which. Now, at uh, one point looked fine, at one point looked worrying. Now it does look really worrying. I know the running we've got in terms of the games around us, but look at these teams. We're not, you know, these teams are winning games. You know, QPR, QPR are winning games. Uh, Huddersfield, man, that's a ridiculous point for them yesterday. You know, QPR winning three one away at Leicester, Birmingham nearly got a result at Southampton. So yeah, I think we, um, yeah, I do think we, I do think we need to be need to be careful. Hopefully, we're looking back on this in three or four weeks, we've got, you know, seven, nine, 12 points or whatever. And we can say, Hey, we were wrong, but it's, it's for me, it's, a, for me, it's a, it's a worry. And and you said it like, he's got to learn the job. I don't know why we're hiring someone that has to learn the job. And is it due to it being the June chip puppet show? And I think we just needed a, I would have taken Warnock to the end of the season. I, I would have done. I mean, again, I'm a fan. I got no clue, but that's certainly something I would have happily taken shore it up. And then reevaluate and, and go again in the in the in the, in the uh, in the summer is what yeah, I personally would have done. A, it's a pretty big pretty big gamble at this point, and I guess only time's going to tell um, whether it, it's worked out. And hopefully, you're absolutely with what you mentioned. We're a few points down the line, um, and we'll look we'll look back on this and go, yeah, maybe we'll be fine. But right now, it's looking a massive gamble at this point. Let's um let's do some very quick fire um questions then that were sent in both tonight on the live stream. Keep them coming in. Um, we do still have to preview Sheffield Wednesday, um, but we were sent a couple of questions um, post game. So we'll quickly rattle through these. Keep the answers as brief as we possibly can um, so that we don't keep everyone awake um, and they don't miss the 10 o'clock news. Um, Barry Evans asked on Twitter, um, Sam, you can take this one if you like. Um, link up play between the midfield and Hardy wasn't great yesterday. What is the answer? Or were they just better than us and stopped anything going through? Um, it's not been great for a few games. It was obviously very good at Middlesbrough when JB managed to link the play with Whitaker to, to Hardy, particularly for the second goal. 
Um, but it is becoming a bit of a concern in other games, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think partly it's just that their general defensive approach is open moaned a few times, sitting too deep, not not having a go at teams enough. Um, again, I want to reiterate the point I made last time I was on the pod that I was so wrong about saying that we should go back to three four three. Completely wrong. I'll be glad to gloat when I'm right. So it's only fair I, I take the slack when I'm wrong. I thought that you know I, when Schumacher was playing this four at the back with inverted fullbacks, I was. I was thinking, hmm, what are we doing this for? We won the league playing 3 4 3. But actually, looking at it now, 3 4 3 in the championship, it, it is a lot worse. We don't control games anymore. And I think under four at the back, and look, I'm not saying four at the back is going to suddenly make everything better. And, and I'm not saying that three at the back is always doomed to lose. But actually, I think all else being equal, four at the back with those four backs coming inside allows us to progress the ball out of defence and allows us to get the ball through the midfield. Because at the minute, we're foregoing the midfield quite often uh, because we're passing it around the back. We're realising there's not really an out ball on. And then we get chased down and we panic and we punt it long because there's no other option. That's what we're doing at the moment. Um, so I think having that thought at the back with the extra man in the midfield allows us to dominate possession a bit more, get the ball through to our very talented attacking players. So hopefully that was quick fire enough. I think we need to go back to 4 3 3. And I promise I won't ever complain about it again if we do. Yeah, we, we were sent one from Pilgrim PT. Um, I'll get Aaron to ask that um, midweek when I'm not in the hosting chair because it would be a bit um, narcissistic of me to answer a question that's sent in about myself. Um, pa, you can have this one, Kerouac99. Um, apologies if I keep butchering your X handle. Because um, it's interesting on the point that you just made about Mikko Miller. As good as Sorinola and Miller have been going forward, defensively they have been way off it and contributed to conceded goals at home in the last few games. Do you think it's time to give Mumba another chance? Yeah, I I like Mumba. I do. I don't, it's disappointing to see the form, shall we say? But I do think the talent is there. I would I'd like to see Mumba and Miller. That's what I want. The, and to keep it quick fire, and this is really what annoyed me was in that West Brom game. That I think it was the second goal. Sorinola had, had, had um, played actually really well. He was knackered, and he played him for an extra ten minutes. I don't understand why he didn't sub him off. Um, he was knackered. So as good as he was, I don't know if he's got the um, the fitness there. But yeah, I definitely do. I I, I am I am pro member personally. I am pro member. Um, what else have we got? Uh, Casey Pilgrim, Adam. Um, we'll come on to the the live questions. We'll get now in a second. Um, Casey Pilgrim asks, why is Fozzie content with waiting to make subs? And when we are one or two nil down, we were crying out for fresh legs from fifty five minutes onwards. No, yeah, I don't disagree at all. It, it's weird how it links in, isn't it? Because this this time last week, we're actually on the podcast and um, discussing how how well the, the, the substitutes went at, at Middlesbrough, you know, the, the way that Foster was able to make them on own terms. And I think it's just another example of how getting ourselves ahead in the game matters so much to Foster's style because falling behind the substitutes, it looks like he doesn't have a clue. When he's able to make them on his own terms, it, it looks like, oh, yeah, that's very sensible. So... Yeah, yesterday, um, back in West Brom, those subs weren't well. They they weren't good enough at all, and they were too late. I I I think that's all very clear. So, yeah, it's um, it, it's one of those. I I don't want to sound too hypocritical because it yeah, it's only been seven days since I was saying how well he used them at the Riverside when we when we were in the game. Um, but it's another thing that just links in with the Plan B, isn't it? He doesn't seem to have one, and the substitutes are very much a part of that. Let's let's be fair. Um, if we weren't a reactionary fan base, this <laughs> podcast would be quite this podcast oh, would be a very dull listen to I'm people. The most right, this is going. This is an interesting um trend of a few questions that have come in tonight. Um, and we're gonna highlight Zach's comment, and we've got a couple more that we can highlight, and it's an open forum, really. Um, where's the coaching team? Like we, yeah, he, yeah, you know it's he, true. He, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I know that you obviously don't want to rush to make a, an appointment for making an appointment's sake. Um, but as Pi mentions, Ian Foster is an inexperienced manager at this level. With all due respect to Neil Jewsnip, I'm not necessarily sure he wants to be on the touchline because that's not his remit. And if he wasn't there mucking in and doing his bit, it would just be Fozzy, Nance and Daryl Flahaben. It's yeah, a bit well, of a concern, think... isn't it? 
One of the tweets I saw, which was quite amusing, um, that was that Daryl Flaharvin was doing the striking warm-up drills as, as the goalkeeping coach. So it just shows how short we are on coaches that the goalkeeping coach is doing the, the striker drills. Yeah, again, another comment there, any chance of an assistant manager, the longer it goes on, the more I feel like Juice is manager. And I wonder if this is basically Neil Juice manager by stealth and, and Foster's just like the... Foster's actually the head coach and, and Jim Snip is, is, is the manager yeah, behind no, the scene. Right, no, one, yeah. no one knows, do they? No one knows. I no. do apologise, by the way. I, I, so I just seen the time. I do have to dash, if that's all right, boys. If that's okay. Uh, yeah, that's all right, Jack. Talk about your questions on Wednesday. But thanks for having me. I do appreciate it. Yeah, been a pleasure, mate. Hopefully see you on again. Yeah, mate. I, honestly, if you want me back, if we, you know, if it if it doesn't go well in the week, um, that might not end uh, end too well. Nice but... to feel in happier circumstances as well. Oh yeah, that would be great, mate. <laughs> Hopefully, we stay up by a point goal difference, whatever, and then we can have a uh, we can have a party. So, thanks very much for having me on. I appreciate Cheers, it. Bye. Cheers, everyone. Thanks, nice mate. Night. Have a great. There we uh, go. Yeah, Sam, go... carry on. Yeah, well, I've I, I've slightly lost the trailer, but yeah, um. Yeah, there's a bit of a theory that Jim Snip is actually the manager, and look, maybe that's a little um, far fetched. But the more it goes on, the more I can't really see any other explanation why we're taking so long. And yes, you know, you could say we're waiting to find the right person, but come on, we're on the clock here. This is not, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, this this is not, um, you know, uh, the, the the off season. This is actually um, a, a situation whereby we really badly need. To, to get the points over the line to stay up, you know, um, yeah, I don't know quite why we're why we're why we're not doing it, and and that's I think it's something we need to address quickly. I mean, Foster had said, you know, it, when he was asked about it, we'll have a look, we'll but we'll maybe you know find the right person when we can, but really, the, come on, the well, this is not the start of the season. This is the business end. Got yeah, the gut feeling I get is that perhaps he has identified or the club have identified who they want to be the number two, um, but perhaps it's not able to be explored until the summer. Um, I hope I'm wrong because, as I say, this is not a slight on Neil Jusen whatsoever, but his remit is not to be on the touchline. Um, and although he said he he enjoyed the, the four games that he took caretaker charge of, I remember him saying himself, um, after the Watford game, you know, he can't wait to go back to his day job. Well, at the moment, he's not really being able to do that. Um, Adam, we'll come on to the last question. And then um, I've kept the thousands of Sheffield Wednesday fans that are watching, waiting long enough for them to hear about how we're going to try and beat the Owls on Tuesday night. Um, Steve Vaughan says, Hardy and Whitaker look burnt out. Maybe they need a rest, but who do we replace them with? Thoughts? Yeah, it's a question I think we've been exploring since since the end of the transfer window, right? And the way that we were hoping, obviously, to get Aziz in and really we'd have all liked another striker as well to be able to rotate. I mean, I know I mentioned in the build-up to the, the game just gone that it would have been nice to see Bundu get a bit more time, particularly with the way that he put their defence to the sword in, in the reverse fixture. So, I don't know, maybe, maybe getting Bundu involved a little more would... Um, would help to plug a few of those gaps but yeah it's um it's thin and it's a symptom of ending that window w without bringing anybody else in for those attacking positions on deadline day because it it looked to all of us like a it was obvious that it needed to be a, a gap that we filled in and b that the club were actively trying to do that with Femi Aziz and I mean I, I don't want to go down the old cliche of of this podcast but is the fact that we didn't get Aziz and nobody else another sign of no plan b I don't know. But um, yeah, it's it's tough. It's tough to see that. And you would have thought, actually, that having that week off would have would have benefited them greatly. I know it didn't seem it. And there's probably other reasons behind that. But yeah, it's um, it's a struggle to see anyone putting Whitaker or Hardy on the bench at the, at the moment. The simple fact that last time and the only time Whitaker hasn't played this season, we lost 4-1 at Bristol City. So it's a bit of a double edged sword. Um yeah, I, I don't know the answer to the question is is the honest truth. But to be fair, I don't think anyone at the club does either. Um, there we have it then. Um, that is the, the Ipswich segment of tonight's um, live podcast done. Um, all this, you know, I know there's been a lot of um, banter flying around on, on social media, as we'd expect there would be. Um, after all the banter and the the, the tomfoolery that went along with the 
the epic title race last year. But, you know, kudos to Ipswich. They they thoroughly deserve the three points. And, um, it, you know, good luck to them for the rest of the season. It would, it would I, you know, I'm I'm in a, the mindset. It would be quite refreshing to see somebody else go up um, to the Premier League. And I'm bored of seeing the same teams yo-yo. Um, so all the best to them in their promotion bid as we now concentrate on ourselves and concentrate trying to stay in the championship, a division that we worked so hard um, to get into. Um, and we move on. The next game, the, the, the Roadshow rumbles on to Hillsborough. Um, as mentioned earlier, when we do our plan at the start of every season for when we're podcasting this game against Wednesday was going to be on a Wednesday. We were going to record on a Thursday. Then Sky have got involved. The game against Wednesday is now on a Tuesday. So we're now going to be live on Wednesday, not Thursday like originally planned, but live on Wednesday to talk about Tuesday on or on talk about Wednesday on Tuesday. I've even messed myself up there. But the 5th of March 2011, 14 years ago, Plymouth Argyle travelled to Hillsborough to play Sheffield Wednesday. We won 4-2. 14 years on, on the 5th of March, 2024, Plymouth Argyle will go to Hillsborough. Thank you to Rory Drake for pointing that quirk out. I'm, I'm not going to say those words that end his his comment because I don't really want to comprehend that. Um, Sam, it was always going to be a six-pointer. Get the cliche in there. It's bloody massive, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely huge game. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit annoyed um, that, that Rory got in there before me on that one. I had that one lined up about the 5th of March. I really did. Oh, oh that's annoyed me. But fair, fair play, Rory. Um, fantastic knowledge. It uh, has to be, obviously, to, to compete with me. But, uh, yeah, um, it is a huge, huge game. Um, because with them, they're still ultimately three points off safety, despite their brilliant run of form. You've got to think for them, if they slip up to us and Stoke win and Millwall win, you know, then all of a sudden they could be, wow, six off safety. And that then they're, then they're really starting to look look like getting caught adrift. And I think Danny Rolls done brilliantly. I think they were on something absolutely ridiculous, like three points out of 13 games when he came in. Um, so the fact that they're even in contention with safety, said he's done a superb job uh, with them. They're, they're a very tough to beat outfit, particularly at Hillsborough. I think since Danny Rolls come in, they've only lost maybe three times at Hillsborough. Not very many. Um, twice even, possibly. I don't know. But but they're, they're very hard to beat on their own ground. Um, I think it's one of those whereby um, if we were going into it in better circumstances, you'd be happy with a draw. Um, with the sort of wave of negativity both from fans and, and dare I say, in some of the head coaches' comments, we really now want to be targeting nothing less than a, a maximum three points from that game. Um, not only that, not only the vibes losing, not only the you know to lift the mood around the club, but also because this is looking, and I, and I think we've probably all made this point offline or in our tweets or whatever, I don't think we've really yet made this point on the podcast, uh, wow. So Jordan uh, in the replies on Wednesday, and I just confirmed that actually I, I was understating it. They've only lost once at home since Ron has been there. So if we can make that twice, we'll have done very well indeed. So fair play, Jordan. I underestimated how well Roll had done. Um, yeah, I think that, what was I saying before I got sidetracked there? Um, I was, yes, I think I was saying that um, not only are the vibes, the point that we've not really yet made on this podcast is this is going to require a probably very high points total to survive. It was only a few weeks ago we were looking at maybe 44, 45 points might be enough. Then with a couple of wins, I think it might be 48, 49. Now I think the more I look at it and the more I look at fixtures, it's probably going to need 50, 51, maybe even 52 points um, to guarantee survival, um, which is very rare, by the way, for this league. Normally 46, 47 is enough um, most years, more often than not. So this is going to be a very rare year uh, where it required such a high total. So a win is vital for us. Um, look, I'm not saying a draw would be a disastrous result. As we've established, Sheffield Wednesday are very, very good at home. But we need to start getting these wins on the board because at the minute, we're, we're on, what is it, 40 or 41? We're on 41, I think we're on, aren't we? For 40, OK, 40. Maybe I was counting the goal if it's our extra point. So it's 40 that we're on. Um, we need... I'm going to say at least three wins and two draws. 
and they've got to start coming from somewhere. And this, you know, I think if we don't come out of Wednesday and Blackburn having at least a win in there, even if we lose the other, if we don't come out of Wednesday and Blackburn having at least a win in there, I will be very, very concerned indeed. Is one of those three wins coming at Hillsborough, Adam? Cool. Well, I was hoping so. And then I heard the stat about them only losing once they're under roll. And um, I'm struggling to see it. But I mean, the job rolls done at, at Sheffield Wednesday needs to be appreciated. And you look at where they were, you know, under Cisco Munoz um, earlier on in the season with, uh, I think you said their sound was like three points and 13 or something like that. And it's interesting because um, you look at the XG and the way that that it's playing, they actually not been too much of a difference. Just about the under Moon Jaws, they lost so many big moments. It, it, it was uncanny. I mean, if you think Plymouth Argyle right now have a soft underbelly, you ain't seen nothing yet. Have a look at Sheffield Wednesday and Cisco Munoz and, and see how much that could go wrong, did go wrong. And Rolls come in and he's put a stop to that. And that's where ultimately he's got a lot of his success. There's also been. Um, Positives in terms of the way that he he's brought players um, either into the team or, or, or back into the team. Um, there's a couple of examples to look at. I mean, Marvin Johnson's one of them. I don't know what was happening with, with him under Munoz. There, there'd obviously been some sort of a falling out, shall we call it, um, between them. I'm not privy to the details. Perhaps I should be, but, you know, unprofessional as ever. But um, the way that it, it he wasn't getting a look in under under Munoz and has come in under, under role and suddenly doesn't lose base in the side and is performing is is an example clear there's some sort of man management that, that has gone on there that that has worked out and and to get one of their best players certainly from last season back into the side he's obviously done something right i look also at um the players that have been brought in 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 the transfer window um Perveda, one of them but particularly uk but i mean he wasn't necessarily pulling up any trees um on loan at Cardiff, but they've obviously seen something in him, um, brought him through the door, and he's really hit the ground running, scored the winner um, very recently, and, and he, that's not the only goal he scored for sure. So, yeah, you know, it's it's difficult to to see, um, actually, with, with the way that, that we've gone, um, certainly in a lot of the previous games, that, that, that a win will come there, particularly with how Rolls got them playing. But as perhaps a crumb of comfort, it was very difficult to see, us going after the West Brom game and uh, and putting a couple of goals past Boris. So maybe, I don't know, it'll it'll be a game that suits us, but we're going to have to spend some time on the back foot. We certainly are. And to use one of Fozzie's cliches, there are going to be periods in this game where we will suffer. Um, but hopefully, fingers crossed, that there will be periods in the game where we will make Wednesday suffer. Um, and hopefully they outweigh the former. Um, we'll move on to some of our thoughts on team news now for the trip to Hillsborough. Um, obviously this week, um, as far as I can work out for the first time all season, the current incumbent of the throne at Plymouth Argyle actually had a full complement of every fit professional to choose from. Even Stephen Schumacher all the way back at the start of the season didn't have a full squad to pick from at any point. Um, so that brings us on to the team news. Now, I personally, throwing my tuppence into the ring, um, I would quite like to see us do a, a, you know, when you're playing football manager, just think of it as a computer game for a minute. You're playing football manager. You're not in great form. You're struggling for a bit of momentum. What do you do? Four, two, three, one, you reset and you go all out attack. Now, I have said for a while this season, and it's in our group chats, and I'm sure somebody will be able to find it. In there that I think 4-2-3-1 actually suits our squad very well. Um, and the way I would set it up would be Gibson and Galloway as the two centre backs. You would have Miller and Soranola or Miller and Mumba, whoever as the as the full backs. You could have two then in midfield of, of Randall, Houghton, or Forshaw. Further forward, you can then get a system where you can play Whitaker, JB and Devine with Hardy up front. Now, I think that's quite an, an interesting concept to go with. I don't, I don't expect it to happen. Um, Sam and Adam, there's a question here. Um, I think, that, uh, Sam, this was in question to what you were saying about the 3-4-3 earlier on from Steve, saying we need to go back to a 4-3-3 or even the 4-2-3 one I've just mentioned. 
Darren says Bundu deserves to start on Tuesday night. Um, we had a few questions about Bundu tonight. And Colin asks, would you stick Dan Scar back in? Um, so what is your, if you had a clean slate, you were given the role by Ian Foster to pick the team, give us a formation, what do you go with? Yeah, 4 3 3. Um, I'm going to go Cooper uh, of a Hazard. I don't think Hazard was to blame for either goal, but I just think Cooper just has that more confidence he inspires in his defence, better command of area, better distribution. And as Hazard's main strength of shot stopping, I think Cooper equals it, probably betters it when he's fully fit. So I'm going to go Cooper in goal. I'm going to then go right. I'm, I'm going to go 4 3 3. I'm going to go. Sorinola, um, right back. I think he's he's had he's had hot and cold moments, but I think he's there's a player in there. I'm gonna go Pleggy and Gibson as the centre backs. I'm gonna then go for Galloway as the left back because I think everyone forgets that I'm, Galloway. I'm glad you said yeah. that because Porra Jotes has sent a comment in about the team that I said about two. Left-footed centre backs, ninety-nine percent of managers scream that. That totally slipped my mind, and it's why I'm not a football manager. But you are right, Sam. Galloway has done it before. He did it last season when we played four at the back in a couple of games, and he, well, he did it this season as well. Left. Yeah, he's he very did it this season as well. Back. Yeah, yeah. So I'd, I'd go. I think I've got a little bit of doubt about Pleggy in a back four because he, that was where he was weaker earlier in the season. But I think with his renewed form and renewed confidence, I'd. I'd I'd go maybe Phillips, but I think it's a bit of a bit of a coin toss. But I think I'd just go Pleggy over Phillips. So I'd go Pleggy, Fuelo, Gibson, Galloway is the left back. I would then go Houghton. Um, I think Forshaw was brilliant um, against Cardiff. He was brilliant first half at Sunderland before he got injured. Um, but he wasn't very good coming on, uh, in all truth, yesterday. So I wouldn't go for him to start. I'd, Again, give him another chance off the bench. So I'd go Houghton. The Houghton in that kind of single pivot where he played so well earlier in the season. Two in front of him. I'm going to go Randall and Divine. I think going back to Pi's comments earlier um, about Divine being a bit disappointing, I kind of agree. But I do think he's, he's a CM. All day long he's a CM. He's not a winger. Uh, I think we played him out of position. So I think if we go to 4 3 3, not that that's the main reason to do so, but another nice side effect of going to 4 3 3 is I think we'll see a lot more good stuff come out of um, Divine. So I'd go Houghton, Randall, Divine. Um, front three, Whitaker, Hardy, Mumba. The same front three as earlier in the season. Um, I think Mumba is a he's a he's a funny old player because I, I think he, I think genuinely as much as I do like him as much as I have stuck up for him a lot this season he he's kind of neither really one thing nor another he's not quite defensively good enough to be an absolutely top class wing back but also his main strength is carrying the ball from deep areas which maybe goes against him playing in the front three because in the front three he's starting in high areas so. It is a difficult one to know what, as much as he does have a very good set of skills, it is at times a difficult one to know what to do with him. But I just think that that cutting inside it will give us a bit of something. So I'm going to go Mumba. I'm going to go with Whitaker, Hardy, Mumba, which then leaves quite a, in theory, strong looking bench that would look something like uh, Hazard, Phillips, JB, Forshaw, uh, Bundu, Wayne, whoever I'm forgetting, uh, Miller. Um, Suits up and Edwards, yeah, that, yeah, probably that. Adam. So yeah, I, I think I'm doing the same with the formation. I think we've discussed it to them. I think four three three at the minute feels like the way to go. I am also very much in agreement with putting Cooper in goal, um, and I don't necessarily think we should be taking that as words against Hazard in the way, in any way. Now I think he's been fine. He certainly wasn't responsible for any of the goals that went in um, at the weekend, but. We've got Michael Cooper. <laughs> you know, it, when you put it down to that, it becomes a simple decision. Michael Cooper is objectively excellent. I think statistically, he has outperformed Cooper. Uh, um, sorry, has outperformed Hazard in even his main strength of shot stopping. So, yeah, he certainly gets in for me. Um, with the back four, um, I'm tempted to agree with um, the Galloway at left back option. Um, 
I think you can make an argument, albeit a tenuous one, that actually he is a left back and um, he he fills in at, at, at centre back on occasion. And whether I necessarily agree with that, I don't know, but he's certainly got enough experience at left back to to carry it off. That is off, no doubt. In the middle, Gibson's an obvious starter. I'm tempted to bring in Phillips for this one. I just think he's less likely to be bullied in the back four by by Ugbo than than Plegasweiler would. But again, with the way that Plegi's been in form, I'm I'm not necessarily against that either. Um, I'm tempted also to think that maybe it's a game where I want to see Joe Edwards come into. I'm not necessarily thinking that he is a better player than everyone we've got as, as an option at right back. Um, but I think P- Pai mentioned it a, a little earlier. In the times of our season, this is one of the bigger games. And having that sort of leadership there, I'm not against it, in truth. I'm not against it at all. So what I there, there is an added bonus there as well, in the sense that if you do have that back four with Galloway as the left back and Edwards as the right back, you do have the option, if you want to, to switch that formation. Bring Galloway... Um, Gibson Phillips into that, into that back three, have Edwards the wing back and Mumba, who is going to be in my team later on, and can switch to the wing back on the other side. It makes it flexible. And I think that's probably, for this specific game anyway, um, the best way we can set up our back four. In the middle, I'm not against Halton at all. Um, and I'm not against Forshaw at all, in truth, based on the way that I've um, just mentioned the leadership point. But bearing in mind that the fact that my my team does already have Joe Edwards in it, I'm not necessarily sure Forshaw is as necessary, so let's throw throw Houghton in there. Um, Randall, the way he's played, um, particularly away from home in the Borough game, I think is a shoe in. Do I put him alongside Divine? Um, yeah, yeah, we'll go for it. Um, I think it's um, certainly on the point that that you've made, Sam, and to be honest, a lot of people have made as well that we think he's going to look better in central midfield. In this formation, is probably the most ideal way to do that. So I'm going for, by the sounds of it, exactly the same midfield and exactly the same front line as you, Sam, with. Um, the Houghton, Randall and Devine in the middle, Mumba, Whitaker, and Hardy providing that front three with the basis that that can allow us to be fluid and that can allow us to switch our shape in a number of ways if we need to. Um, I don't mind your idea, Joe, about the the four two three one. although using a, the football manager analogy and, and bleeding it dry, I'm not entirely sure what the fitness levels are in this team. I'm not sure if the, the green heart next to every player is quite as green as it should be after a, <laughs> after a tough old game at the weekend. So uh, uh, I'm not sure. The difficulty I have with the the four two three one is it, I don't think that's the sort of shape that would suit Halton the best it could. I think the way that we we've seen him play and excel certainly at this level has been in in that in that single pivot in the deeper role. I'm not entirely sure it would suit him as well in the four two three one, but um again, um maybe I'm wrong. But yeah, I'm yeah, I I I take the comment on board as well. This is on the basis that that, that I have the clean sh- clean slate and I can decide the team realistically it's going to be a back three and um, it, we, we should probably be thinking of ways to make that work. But yeah, for me, I think that four, three, three formation with, for, for this one is the way to go. And yeah, the only changes I make from, from Sam's side is a couple at the back. And even on those, I'm, I'm happy to waver either way. So I think we're thinking on similar lines. Yeah. This, this is also quite an interesting game. I, I'm sort of mindful of the fact that we, we rattled through talking about the game. We didn't really highlight any of, of Sheffield Wednesday's, um, key threats, obviously, Ugbo has got a, a fair mention there, and um, you know we all know the the potential, not the potential. He's he's in his thirties now, but we all know the ability of Barry Bannon and and what a tenacious character he is. And and Volks is back in the side. They've got a very settled back line as well. Masaba on one side, Paveda on the other. They they seem to have a real set um system and under Danny Rule and it, it's it's definitely going to be a different game to the one that we had when when he first came in he's you know the the way he's united that football club really is a is a testament to him um you would have to wonder um if he manages to keep them up which at the start of his tenure looked incredibly unlikely but he's making a bloody good fist of it at the moment you'd have to wonder just how many potential suitors will be looking at the job he's done to take him either higher up this division or perhaps even to tempt him to a to one of the potential jobs that could become available in the merry-go-round that's expected in the Premier League um, over the summer because I certainly think he is a manager who could go right to the very top um, with what he's showing at Sheffield Wednesday but that's enough of that there's only one thing left to do um, and it's the bit that we all 
really look forward to, and that is to to get some score predictions off the panel. Sam, come to you first. Um, as mentioned, six points, a big game. Final score between Sheffield Wednesday and Plymouth Argyle is? Uh, I'll give a little bit of a justification. I'm torn between two instincts. I'm torn between the instinct that actually, you know what? He's only been our manager 11 games. All of our worrying about Foss is going to make us look really silly and he's going to get a win like he did at Borough. One part of me saying that, another part of me saying, no, the vibes are all off. We're going to get up. We're going to go there and get absolutely beat around the park and lose 3 0. And I don't know which side to trust. So I'm going to go straight down the middle. I'm going to go 1 1 draw. <laughs> Howard. Adam. Oh, I'm, I'm also very much a coward here. I was going to say 1 1 as well. I think simply for the fact that. Um, I know they don't lose often at home at all at the minute, but I think it's a a, a style of play and, and the sort of game that could just about suit us if we play it right. So one or I think it even itself out. Um, I'm going to be even more boring than the pair of you. Um, and we don't have too many of these. Um, I actually think that this is a game that both teams are going to be really paranoid about that we cannot lose um and i think we might cancel each other out here and this could be a a nil nil um i hope i'm wrong because you know i want to see an entertaining game of football on tuesday night um but i do just wonder with everything that's going on around with you know it seems everyone um below us is now in form um and everyone from us and above are not in form um which lends as a neutral watching the championship this year for it to be a really interesting end to the season. But I do think it'll be tight. It wouldn't surprise me if there's only one goal in it. Um, we don't, as I say, we don't have too many of those games. Um, certainly not in the last few years. Um, that is all for tonight. We've kept you for an hour and, and 36, 37 minutes. A um, couple of things to say. First of all, thank you to everyone who's contributed in the comments um, this evening. Um, if you have, If you are only just tuning in, and you have missed um, this live episode, it will be available on all your podcast platforms, on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. You can find it wherever it, um, it is. You've logged on to watch it now, so you can watch it back. Um, if you want to see certain moments of it, then feel free to, to go back at a later date. Um, as mentioned, the game is now on Tuesday night on the 5th of March. Um, it is a co-exclusive broadcast on Sky Sports, um, Sky Sports Arena. I think it is the the channel that's been selected for it. Program starts at seven forty. I think co exclusive basically means that Sky will show it, but you can also buy it through um, Argo TV and Owls TV, whatever it is, the Sheffield Wednesday um, option. But the game is live for everyone to watch on Sky, and we will be back live on Wednesday night for yet another busy show. I'm sure Aaron's back in the in the seat. Um, just to let everyone know, I was not showing Aaron's comments. Aaron is in the gallery tonight. He was showing his own comments. Bit petty, if you ask me. Uh, but he will be back in the hosting chair on Wednesday night. And we've got a few of the, the regulars in, in place for Wednesday, I believe, without looking at the rotor uh, right now. Um, Adam, Sam, thank you for joining me. Um, <laughs> you started it. Um, thank you for joining me, Ben. Um, who joined us earlier, thanks to him. And of course, Pie Face as well. Um, great to have Pie on the Green and White podcast. Um, and it won't be the last time, we hope, between now and the end of the season moving forward. Um, but do keep an eye out on Wednesday night for the live stream post Sheffield Wednesday, where we will also preview the trip to Blackburn at the weekend. Um, and then, if you haven't already, um, we brought out a My Argo Life last week with the excellent Chris Webb, who has spent time as president of the football club and, of course, was a key figure in the administration process. Sam and Aaron sat down with Chris in an episode that was released on Wednesday, I think it was. Um, and it really is a very, very good episode. And it's to go alongside the My Argo Life with Graham Clark, who is a podcast panellist um, as they discuss the administration and what can be done. Chris gives a good insight as what can be done for Torquay United. Um, last but not least, I'm going to stop waffling in a minute. Do check out, if you haven't already, the Devon Day that we are trying to promote in conjunction with Torquay United to get as many people to play more on the 23rd of March. We don't have a game. It's the international break. Torquay are home to Hampton and Richmond, I think it is, um, in the National League South. 
um, that day at Plainmore. And it would be great if those who are in the area or just fancy getting out of the house for a few hours if the sun's if the sun's shining to get yourself to the Riviera um, and go along and support Torquay. They're, they're in desperate need of, of everyone to show them a bit of support at the moment. Um, as far as I know, they're not yet officially in administration, but they have served the notice that they intend to go into administration. But, um, you know, we wish our, our friends at Torquay all the best. That's it for tonight, Adam, Sam. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And we will see you all on Wednesday evening. And don't forget, tomorrow's a new day. It's a new week. It's some big games this week. Good night, folks. <laughs>